all right. Let's have a little singing. Come on, boys. And uh, you pray for them. I offered to sing back up for them. They turned me down. Cold. And, uh, you say, how rude. No, they, they just heard me sing. And uh, so if you'd hear me sing, you'd be glad they turned me down too. So I'm just kidding. But we love these boys. We're, we're uh, grateful for them. You pray for them now uh, as they sing. All right. Now let me say this. The altars are always open here. Uh, you say, well, I don't want to hinder anything. Well, we really, we got a, a loose idea of what we're doing. But we certainly want to give the Lord an opportunity to do what he wants to do. And so you're not going to hinder anything. If you need to come to the altar, the altars are always open. Uh, you won't mess up our plan because we really ain't got one. We just want the Lord to have his way. And uh, so uh, let's go to meeting and then enjoy the good blessings of God. Because 
we were so empty and we couldn't fill that void with the world. That's the same reason we, we need to stay with him. Yeah. The, the world still won't fill that void that we have right. in our hearts. Right. Yeah. He's the only one that can do what he has done. Yeah. Take 
melt this heart of stone. It took Jesus and the blood he shed on Calvary. No one else can do what he's done for me.
have been studying. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Appreciate that, fellas. Thank you. Uh, wasn't that good? Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. And, uh, if you'd have seen me, yeah, yeah. yeah. Before he found me, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah, you'd understand why I love him so. Yeah. 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 I was a wreck. Yeah. My life was a mess. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't raised on a church pew. Right. I was a heathen. Yeah. And uh, my mom and daddy went to church and took me to church. But at about the age of 14, they got out. And so those critical years, right. from 14, 15, 16 on up, uh, I had, I'll be honest, I was just a, a rank infidel and heathen. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Life was a mess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't care nothing about God. Didn't care nothing about eternity. Didn't care nothing about the Bible. Right. Right. Didn't right. care nothing about church. Yeah, yeah. preach. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't even looking for him. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, but he came looking for me. Yeah. Yeah. And found me. Yeah. And saved me. Yeah. Yeah. And changed my life. Yeah. You might. I'm not everything I'm supposed to be Fine. now. Yeah. But thank God I ain't what it used to be. Right. Yeah. I ain't what I'm going to be. Right. But thank God I ain't what it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And uh, he's been more than a savior. Yeah. To me. Right. Yeah. And uh, I'm grateful for his kindness, his generosity. I'm thankful for his correction. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm thankful that he gets after me when I need it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thankful. Man, I appreciate it. And uh, I'm thankful for all of his good blessings. And uh, he has been so kind and so gracious and so long-suffering uh, with me. And uh, I sure do love him. Yeah. Best thing ever happened. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the truth. Yeah. And uh, if you've heard me preach more than twice, you have probably heard me heard my testimony. And uh, I was living in a little one-bedroom apartment at 203 Veneta Drive, apartment number four. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Amen. In Morganton, North Carolina, lost on my way to hell, I worked with a boy who was saved, and uh, he began witnessing to me. I didn't know it, but he'd go home and pray and beg God to save me. He'd come to work and witness to me, and I got under conviction, man. I, I, I listen. There wasn't no more fun in my dope. Amen. There wasn't no more fun in my liquor. And, and listen, I got absolutely miserable in my sin. Yeah. And uh, that old boy had a brother who's a pastor uh, by the name of Sam Bellini. And uh, he brought me a, vid- a VCR tape. That's how long I've been saved. <laughs> brought me a VCR tape. Said, take it home and watch it. And I'll be honest, I was so miserable I'd have done anything trying to find relief. I stuck that VCR tape uh, in my VCR and turned my TV on. And that preacher got up and said this. He said, the man on this side was dying in sin. The man on that side was dying of sin. But the man in the middle was dying for sin. Yeah. Yeah. And when he said it, I'm telling you, it's like God opened the windows of glory. Yeah. Come down to that little one-bedroom apartment at 203 Veneta Drive. Dealt with my heart. And right there on that spot, oh, I yeah. turned my couch into an altar. Amen. And I fell in the I fell in that couch and wept my way to God. Yeah. And I said, God, I'm wicked, and God, I'm sorry, and God, I'm low down, and God, I deserve to go to hell. Yeah. But Lord, I don't want to go. And I know Jesus died for me, and Lord, yeah. you'll have me. I'll come. Yeah. And guess what? He did. He saved yeah. me. Oh, right yeah. Yeah. At, at, at 203 Veneta Drive, they wasn't no choir. Yeah. They wasn't no preacher. Right. They wasn't no camp meeting. It just me and the Lord. Yeah. And God saved me. Yeah. I've been almost 28 years now. And uh, my soul. I tell people this all the time. If I could take him out of my heart and give him to you for five minutes, yeah. you'd never want to give him yeah. that's, right. yeah. that's true. Yeah. Thank God for the saving. Yeah. Yeah. Tonight I want to take a Bible to the book of 1 Peter, please. 1 Peter chapter number 5. And uh, I want to deal with something tonight that's probably not... Probably not going to be your favorite message of mine. Let me put it that way. Uh, but I do feel like this is the way the Lord would have us go. And uh, I have a couple of messages prepared. and uh, But the Lord keeps drawing my attention back to this thought, my heart back to this thought. So I want to give you something simple. Uh, but something I feel like in our day uh, is desperately needed. And... Uh, 
First Peter chapter number five. And uh, I want to read one verse for time's sake. I got a whole lot to say, but we'll see. I, I, I finally learned this uh, as I've gotten older. Just because you wrote it down don't mean you've got to say it. Right. <laughs> and, uh, there's a few young preachers could probably use that advice. Uh, but I want to give you what the Lord wants you to have, and so we may not cover all of it, but we'll try to give you what the Lord's given us. Look at verse number 8, 1 Peter chapter number 5, and verse number 8. The Bible says, be sober. Yeah. That means serious. Be serious. Be vigilant. means be on guard. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, Seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9. Who, uh, we'll go ahead and read verse 9 anyway. Who resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Let's pray. Our Father, tonight we're grateful for our friends. Lord, it thrills my heart to see you use them all over the country. And Lord, it, it thrills my heart uh, to be in meeting with them again. Lord, our prayer is you continue to bless them, continue to use them, continue to protect them. Lord, I pray, uh, Father, that you would dump your richest blessings down upon them. And Lord, we certainly appreciate them. And Father, tonight, I, I know in this flesh dwelleth no good thing. And Lord, I can't do anything in and of myself. Lord, so I understand this. If anything gets done, you'll have to be the doer of it simply because I cannot. And so, Lord, I, I ask you, I beg you, I beseech you, Lord, uh, to touch me and anoint me and do me and empower me. Lord, I pray you give us clarity of mind and speech. I pray you give us unction and liberty. Lord, I pray that the truth that we preach will find a lodging place down into the heart of your people. Lord, may this truth, uh, may we be reminded of it. And Lord, may we ever be sober and vigilant. Lord, I pray you to help me to present this truth, Lord, for your glory. Lord, whatever you do, we'll thank you. We'll praise you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This, morning, this evening, by way of introduction, I want to begin this, the, the message by saying this, that there is no, uh, there's, there's no way a born-again Christian can be demon-possessed. Where the devil inhabits the body of the believer. Yeah, right. There is absolutely no scriptural proof of the devil or a demon inhabiting a believer. Amen. Now, can he inhabit a lost person? Yes. Yeah. You'll find this truth mentioned in the scriptures repeatedly. Right. We read of Mary Magdalene and the Bible says, out of whom he cast seven devils. We read of the madman of Gadara in Mark chapter number 5. And uh, the Bible says he was filled with a legion of demons. Right. Yeah. You will find Jesus shows up and casts those demons out. They, get, they go into a herd of swine. And those swine, those hogs, run down uh, a steep place uh, into some water and are drowned. And so we see that... Uh, an unbeliever can certainly be possessed. But many times, it's not that a believer uh, has been indwelt by a demon, but the works of the flesh are made manifest in their lives. And many mistake these works of the flesh and try to blame the devil for what is really just your rotten, sorry flesh. Right. You see, if you can blame a devil for certain behaviors, then it relieves that individual of their responsibility right. Right. to keep their flesh in check. Right. They can simply blame it on the devil or some demon, and then they feel like they have voided the responsibility to keep their, their flesh in check. Amen. They say it wasn't me, it was the devil. Yeah. And now they have an excuse for unscriptural behavior. Yeah. So tonight I want to begin by saying that no believer uh, can be possessed by a devil. Amen. Now, 
uh, demon possession, again, for the believers is an impossibility. But when we look at the Bible, there are some verses that will confirm what I just told you. You will find in 1 John 4, 4, the Bible says this, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Right. The verse leads us to believe that when Jesus took up residence in your heart, he ain't looking for a roommate. Right. He is not going to share the believer with anyone. Right. May I remind you, the Bible says we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Right. And in order for you to be demon-possessed as a believer, the devil would have to have the ability to break that seal yeah. and get inside something that God has, took, has taken uh, and made off limits to the devil. Yeah. And so many times, uh, people think, well, uh, you know, it's, it's really the devil that made me do it. No, it's that flesh, that body of flesh that you and I live in. Right. You say, somebody said, well, you've got the demon of jealousy. No, that ain't a demon, that's just you. Right. 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 Yeah, that's right. And so many people are looking for deliverance <coughs> of this demon of jealousy or demon of whatever or demon of this or demon of that. And they're looking for deliverance from that demon when really what you need to do is go home, read your Bible and pray and fast until God delivers you yeah. from your wicked flesh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a flesh thing. Right. That's the problem. Right. And if you can blame the devil and push it off on the devil, then you feel like you have not, you have no responsibility. But the truth is you do have the responsibility. If you have something in your life tonight that is unscriptural, if you have something in your life tonight that is displeasing to the Lord, you have an obligation. And you need to come to an altar right. and you need to confess that thing and repent of that thing and make that thing right with God. Right. And then you need to get up and ask God for strength to help you to not uh, return to whatever thing uh, it, that is unscriptural in your life. And so I want to begin by saying that no believer can be demon possessed. But now, the question becomes, since the, the believer cannot be demon-possessed, should we ignore the devil altogether? I mean, may I say this, the Christian that ignores and pretends that there's not a devil or that the devil is not interested in them is deceiving themselves and you are running the risk of being led astray right. by the devil. Yeah. May I remind you, our text calls him our adversary. Yeah. He is our enemy. Yeah. And listen, because he cannot get your soul, he'll do the next best thing and try to get your life. Right. And he will try to ruin your testimony. He will try to ruin your life. Yeah. And he will try to render you ineffective in the service of your king. Right. Yeah. He'll do everything that he can to try to convince you to live unscripturally yeah. And to convince you that you're justified in your unscriptural behavior. Right. And so tonight, the believer has an adversary. And just because he cannot be possessed by a demon or, uh, or by a devil, doesn't mean we can ignore him completely. We must be aware of our enemy, and we must be aware of his tactics. Right. And so tonight, I want to remind you that there is a real enemy that is against your soul. There is a real enemy who would like to knock you out of church. There is a real enemy who wants to ruin your marriage. There is a real enemy that wants to destroy your friendship. There is a real enemy who wants to destroy your fellowship with the God who loves you and saves you. And so since he saved you, he, you have been put in fellowship. But if the devil can get you living in sin, he can interrupt uh, that fellowship that you need to, to stay in touch with the Savior. Right. The devil is after you tonight. Yeah. Mother, Daddy, the devil is not only after you, he's after your children. Right. And he will do and say anything. He will stoop to any level 
to try to ruin you, and if he can't get you, he'll try to ruin your children. Right. Tonight, it is a foolish believer who just traces through the Christian life without any regard to our enemy. And tonight, you say, well, ah, the devil ain't bothering me. If you're not careful, you're going to be the next one out of church. Right. The devil has gotten better Christians than you. And he's gotten better Christians than me. And so tonight, we must be aware that there is a real devil. And just as there's a real Savior, there is a real devil. And can I be honest, you switch teams when you got saved, and he's mad about it. Right. And he is not going to rest content until he tries some form or some way to get you messed up and fouled up and get you wrecked and get you ruined and get you off in the ditch right. somewhere. And so tonight I want to show you just three or four places out of the Bible and try to give you some insight into this great truth of our adversary. Now, tonight, you can say what you want to about the devil. I will probably amen it, as long as it's bad. Amen. But one thing you cannot say about the devil is that he's lazy. Yeah. Right. Amen. He never gives up. He never quits. Amen. And he never takes a day off. Right. He, he consistently uh, dogs believers trying to wreck them and mess them up. Right. And tonight, we better learn to recognize the devil for who he is, lest he destroy us. Yes. Do you know how many people have went to a church and they maybe got settled in and there was some sort of disagreement between them and another believer and the devil stepped in and turned that believer's mind and thinking to such a way that they just absolutely quit church and they are sitting at home tonight when they ought to be in church. Yeah. Amen. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. May I be honest? I've experienced it over and over and over again. The attacks of the devil. Right. And so tonight, you'd be amazed at what your Bible has to say yeah. about the devil. You'd be amazed at what the Scripture, how sprinkled throughout the New Testament, we are warned. As a matter of fact, in our text it said, be sober. This whole deal about there being a real devil and him being after you, you better take that seriously. You better be sober about that. You can't laugh that thing off and say it ain't a big deal and it don't matter. You better be very careful and take this subject of your adversary very, very seriously. Right. He said we must be vigilant. He means you've got to stay on guard and make sure you're not letting the devil into your life. Right. Amen. Now, many times, uh, the devil will try to use what we listen to and what we watch right. and what we think to lead us away from the things of God. Right. It's of utmost importance, a child of God, that you are careful about what you what you look at, right. what you listen to, right. and what you think. Right. Yeah. Because the devil is looking for a way in. Amen. And so tonight, I just want to throw three or four of these at you and try to be a help and a blessing to you. You'll find that, if any Bible turns to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, let me show you uh, one that many uh, are really just don't understand or they've never really thought about. I want to give it to you tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. We're going to look at three or four verses and we're going to call these boys up to sing again and I'm going to hunt something to So, 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look at verse 10. Mm -hmm. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of of Christ. Now, listen, you ain't got to be the head teller at Walmart to understand the context of the verse I just read to you. Amen. He is speaking about forgiveness. It would seem obvious to me in just even a casual look at the verse, he is dealing with forgiveness. But look at the next verse. Verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Do you realize 
realize one of the tricks of the devil that works like a charm is to fill your heart with unforgiveness against someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Holding a grudge, <clears throat> feeling like you have been wronged, and feel like uh, that, that somebody did not treat you properly, and maybe it's right. Maybe that's exactly right. Maybe they did stab you in the back. Maybe they did do you wrong. Right. Maybe they did uh, mistreat you. But hear me, if you don't get that bitterness right and get that hard feelings out of your heart, it is going to hinder you and the devil will have an advantage over you. Right. And tonight, many believers sitting on church pews without even realizing it, they, they don't even understand that they are hindering the work of the Spirit in their lives because they're hanging on to some sort of unforgiveness, maybe some childhood trauma, maybe somebody, uh, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, uh, something somebody said about them, uh, some kind of gossip or some kind of uh, cream comment, and they hang on to that stuff and they allow it to build up uh, down in their hearts, and before you know it, they have uh, strangled uh, the Spirit of God living inside of them to the point He cannot work or move right. in their life. Did you see it? Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Tonight, the devil's looking for any advantage he can get. And the easiest way is for you to have unforgiveness Amen. in your heart. Right, right. Flip over to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Let me show you another one. Tonight, you better make sure there's no hard feelings. Or no bitterness in your heart. Can I say this? He'll use it on couples. Yeah. I felt a little something right there. I felt like better. <clears throat> Just a minute. I'm from the mountains of North Carolina where I started preaching. And when you got to that spot where you felt like you needed to be, somebody would say, Preacher! Shake that bush. <laughs> so excuse me while I shake that bush. Just a minute. Amen. Hear me. Your husband will say something to you. And you won't, you won't say a word back, you'll walk off. But you'll go in your bedroom and allow that stuff to well up in your heart. Yeah. And you will hang on to it day after day. And you will think about it. And the devil will remind you of what he said. That's some hurtful thing. Something he failed to do. And he may not even know you're mad at him. Right. Amen. Well, my husband, he should have done this. And he didn't do it. And that poor boy ain't got a clue. But the devil has jumped inside of your head and in your heart saying you're right to be mad at him. Right. How dare he say that? How dare he forget that? How dare he not do that thing? And before you know it, it'll build up. And then a month or two will go by and he'll say something else. And he'll say, I can't believe he said that either. And before you know it, over time, all of that trash begins to build up in your heart until one day you just say, look, I'm done. I'm finished. I'm leaving. And there stands a husband with no clue of what he has done wrong. Right. You better get that stuff out of your heart. Right. You better get that thing under the blood. And if it's a big deal, set your husband down, talk to him about it. Explain it to him. But as long as you're hanging on to that and you're carrying that around with you every time, every misdeed, every mistake, every harsh word, every unkind word, uh, uh, something that he's forgotten to do, something that he ignored, you're allowing that to build up in your heart and it's going to ruin your marriage. Right. Amen. Yours would not be the first. There is a real devil... Hear me. You know why the devil hates the family? Because it is the foundation of the church. Right. Amen. So goes the home. So goes the church. And if he can tear the family up, then guess what? He can weaken and soften the church. Right. Amen. Why do you think he has pushed the sodomite agenda the last 10 years? Right. Amen. They're trying to destroy the nuclear family. Yes. A man and a woman and children. Amen. Why do you think the devil's after the home? Because if he gets the home and fouls up the home, he can foul up the church. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't start with, I'm a boy when I think I'm a girl. That ain't the way it starts. It starts with him putting thoughts in your head against your spouse and they said this and hurt my feelings and instead of talking to him about it or instead of going and praying about it, you allow that stuff to build up in your heart and before you know it, you are bitter and you are angry and you have hatred down in your heart and the Holy Ghost can't even work and move in your life. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It means the devil has got an advantage. Right. 
fellas, you better be careful. If the devil wants to destroy the, the, the second most important relationship in your life, is, the first one is with the Lord, the second one is with your spouse. Right. Yeah. right. Tonight, if there's problems, there's issues, you need to repent of that stuff, get that junk out. You say, but I'm right, yeah, and you've done Jesus way worse than your spouse ever did you. Right. And he forgives you, yeah. you've got to forgive. Yeah. You want to have a good marriage? You want to have a good home? Listen to me. If I got if I got to go and apologize to my wife, I will gladly do so. You say why? I fight enough hell out here. I don't want to fight it at the house too. Amen. 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 If I have hurt my wife, if I've wronged my wife, I'll tell you the story's gonna make me look bad. But <laughs> I've been preaching long enough now. I couldn't impress you if I wanted to. I stand here Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday. Now y'all gonna find this hard to believe. Y'all ain't going to believe it because I'm so sweet. Y'all are going to struggle to believe this. One Sunday morning we was on our way to church and I was studying. I was looking over my notes and I'm, I'm focused. And I'm, I'm one of them guys when I'm starting doing one thing, I can't do nothing else. I'm, I'm focused. Amen. And my wife asked me a question. And then she, I didn't hear her. She said, did you hear me? Did you hear me? I said, babe, I'm studying. My wife said, Okay. I'll run us both in the ditch, kill us both. <laughs> she didn't say that. <laughs> she probably thought it. <laughs> so I get to church, and I'm sitting on the platform, and, it, and, and the Spirit of God reminded me what I said. And the Holy Ghost told me this. You go down there and apologize to your wife, or I ain't going to bless your message. Amen. You say, what'd you do? I said, sing another verse. Off the platform I came, I walked right over there, you can ask me. I walked right over there and I said, I was short with you earlier and I want to apologize and I'm sorry. I love you. I was just busy. I ain't making no excuses and I got right with my wife. Then I went back to the pulpit to preach. Here's what you don't understand. That harsh word sticks. Right. That ugly comment sticks. And it do, it, you'd be wise uh, regularly to get right with each other and to apologize to each other and, and to make sure your home is in harmony tonight. And hear me, if you allow that stuff in your heart, you are giving the devil an advantage over you and your spouse. And it's going to get bigger. And that divide is going to grow wider and wider until there is no hope for your marriage. And your marriage goes down the tubes. Amen. Secondly, you'll find that the devil wants to get an advantage of you. But 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Look at verse 18. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Not only does he want to get an advantage of you, he wants to hinder you. Yep. Why is it when I get down to pray, I can think of 37 other things I'm supposed to be doing. Right. Lord, I've got to call so-and-so back. I've got to go pick up the dry cleaning. I've got to get... Lord, I'm sorry. Help me to focus. You know, the devil is trying to hinder you. If the devil can hinder you from praying, he can hinder you. If the devil can hinder you from reading your Bible, he can hinder you. And hear me, the believer that's not daily reading your Bible and praying and walking with God, you are a prime target for the devil. And he's going to do everything that he can to try to hinder you. Listen, you ever wonder why stuff goes wrong on Sunday morning? You think that's an accident? No. It's the devil trying to hinder you. He wants to keep you out of church. He wants to keep you from living for God. He wants to hinder you and prevent you from getting closer to the Lord and living in the joy of the Lord and in the presence of the Lord and in the power of the Lord. He wants to hinder you from being a witness and leaving a trap. And anybody ever done this? That the Lord will let you and say, hand them a trap. And the devil will hunt You better not. They'll think bad of you. The devil is going to do everything that he can to try to hinder your service and your relationship with the Lord. Right. Amen. Tonight you must be very careful that every day you're going to pray, every day you're going to read your Bible, every day you're going to walk with God. That is the only way to avoid the hindrances of the devil. Right. Right. Amen. We ain't going to finish this. Let's look on. 
Look at Ephesians chapter number 4. Look at verse number 25, Ephesians 4, 25. Wherefore, Ephesians 4, 25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. Amen. How many believers have given the devil place in their life? <clears throat> and so tonight, you say, how do we give him place? According to the context, why? According to the context, we are angry. And when you get angry, if you're not careful, listen, nothing wrong with being angry as long as you don't sin. Right. But many times when we get angry, we start sinning either with our mouth or with our actions. Right. And what you're doing is when you get angry and start to sin, you are giving the devil a place really? in your life. Right. It's like inviting the devil to come and sit down at your dinner table and giving him place. And according to the context, two ways you do it, lying and getting angry. Listen, honesty is important. Yeah. Honesty matters. Yeah. Character matters. Living scripturally matters for the believer. Yeah. And tonight, you better be careful how many men have gotten messed up because they got angry and said or did something. And next thing you know, uh, you know, man gets mad at his wife. And before you know it, that thing turns violent. Next thing you know, he's charged with murder and he spends the rest of his life on death row. Why? Well, because he allowed the devil to have place when he got angry. Right. right. You said it couldn't happen to me. Yeah, that's what the, that's what the same thing I yeah. said. Yeah, right. Amen. The devil's looking for a seat at your table. Yeah. And you better be very careful that he doesn't find it. Yeah. Tonight. There is a real devil. I'm going to throw these at you and we'll give you the last one. You can find that the devil will tempt you. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 4 and 5. This is what the Bible says. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempts you not for your incontinency. Listen to me, the devil's going to tempt you to do wrong. And you know why he does that? So he can rub it in the face of Almighty God. Right. And says, look how good you've been to them. Now look. Yeah. Hear me, temptation is around every corner. And if you allow, if you open yourself up to it, it won't be long till you fall for temptation. Right. Moving on. Take your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. I want to show you two verses and I'm done. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. These two verses deal with our adversary. Look at verse 6. Speaking of a pastor. Notice what it says. In verse 6, it lists the qualifications earlier in the passage. But we get to verse 6 and it says this, Not a novice, not a beginner, not a babe in Christ. Let him not be a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Let me ask you something. What was the condemnation of the devil? What caused the devil to be condemned? According to Isaiah 14, it's pride. Yeah. When you read the passage in Isaiah 14, it says, I will. I will. I will be like the Most High. I will ascend my, my throne above the stars. I will. I will. I will. I will. Hear me tonight. The, one of the greatest things, one of the greatest tricks the devil ever pull on you is to make you think you're something special. When yeah. you're yeah. Pride. Yeah. Arrogancy. And the Bible even warns the young preacher 
that, listen, you better be very careful about trying to become a pastor when you are not mature enough to handle the role of a pastor because pretty soon the devil will start saying, look how great you are. Yeah. Look yeah. what a blessing you are. And you'll start thinking to yourself something, and guess what? Here comes the devil around the corner. And yeah. That's all she yeah. did. You say you believe it? I've seen it over and yeah. over Amen. and over again. But notice the next verse. Look at verse number 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Notice this. Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Do you realize that the devil lays snares for believers? Amen. You know what a snare is? Scripturally speaking, it is a wire that is made into a loop. And it is, it is covered with leaves or, or, or some other kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, debris. And some bird comes walking into it. And then all of a sudden, the snare is snapped and it snatches his leg and it can't get loose. He has become trapped. Whoever laid the snare can simply walk up on him and grab him, either kill it right there or hold him, release that snare, and now he, is, now he belongs to the person who laid the snare. Do you realize the devil's trying to do that tonight in your life? Right. He's trying to lay a snare for you. And if you're not careful, you're going to walk right into it. Then you're going to find yourself trapped. You're going to find yourself stuck. You're going to find yourself messed up. And you're going to try everything in the world to get loose. And you're going to find, you're, you're going to find that you have fallen into the snare of the devil. And he is going to wreck you. And he is going to ruin you. Listen, I like to shout and I like to, I like to I preach on grace this morning. But hear me tonight. You need to be reminded there is a real yeah. devil yeah. who is seeking and who is laying a snare for you and is yeah. plotting and planning right. for your destruction, your home's destruction, your yeah. children's destruction, your spouse's destruction, and he is laying snares. Why do you think the Bible says men ought to walk circumspectly? Right. right. You need to be careful where you're, be careful where you're stepping. Yeah. You got to be on guard. What does that mean? Every decision you make matters. Yeah. That's right. Every decision, fellas, you make for your home matters. Amen. Every decision, if it's not led by the Lord, you make the wrong decision. And it's not just you who is going to suffer. It may be your wife. It may be your children. Because you have, uh, without any care, without any regard, you just came trancing through this place. And you have been snared. Ensnared by the devil. And it will hurt you. And it will ruin you. And you will be a failure. And you will be uh, messed up. And you will be uh, unable to get yourself free from the mess you've made. Tonight, there's a real devil. Tonight, you better be aware of it. You better be mindful of it. You better take precautions. You better stay sober. You better be vigilant. You cannot let your guard down, especially right here in the last of the last day. Yeah. We are seeing this thing get worse. and worse. I'm seeing stuff now that I just scratch my head. I'm not talking about being a lost and dying world. It's bad enough. Yeah. But I'm seeing stuff in Baptist churches. Right. Yeah. You ever heard something so dumb you just had to squint at it? Yeah. The devil wants to wreck you. He wants to wreck your home. He wants to drag you out of this church. Right. And you and I better be very careful that we don't allow the devil to get an advantage in us. So tonight... I thought I'd preach this message and encourage you. Amen. Now you watch. The devil's going to come this week at you. You better be on guard and pay attention. I'm not in this game. As a matter of fact, boys, y'all come. Tonight, let me ask you something. How's your home? How are you and your spouse? How's your relationship with your children? Is everything all right? Is there animosity? Is there tension in your home? Before I let the devil tear my marriage up, I'd grab my wife by the hand, I'd find my way to an altar, and I would do business with the God of heaven to make sure that everything's all right between me and mama. And tonight, the old saying is true, you don't know what, it's, what you got until it's gone. And if you don't handle it now, 
that thing is going to grow and it's going to get worse until it rips your home into it. Tonight, you better be very careful. How's everything with you and your wife? Wives, how's everything with you and your husband? If there's any issues, if there's any problems, if there's any hard feelings, if there's any animosity, if there's any tension there, you better get on an altar and get it right and do business with God over it. Because if you don't, it's going to get worse. As we stand, Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the warning. Lord, I pray, Lord, tonight for the listener, Lord, there's no doubt in my mind the devil wants to entrap and ensnare and get an advantage over us. He wants to hinder us and prevent us from living the Christian life properly. Father, tonight there's no doubt there's people under the sound of my voice that have been attacked. Lord, they, 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 they've been tempted. Lord, the snare has been laid. Father, I pray you'd help them to recognize it. I pray you'd help them to stay close to you. I pray you'd help us all to be mindful and sober and vigilant that, that we have an adversary that would like nothing better than to destroy our lives, our homes, our churches. Lord, our prayer is tonight you would keep us mindful. And Lord, if, if someone's already leading that way, I pray tonight you would deal with their heart. Lord, they would come to an altar. They would do business with you. And Lord, they'd make that thing right, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Lord, help your people tonight. Help us to be on guard. Lord, whatever temptation, whatever uh, advantage the devil's trying to get over us, help us, Father, tonight, not to fall for the tricks and the traps and the temptations of the devil. So, Lord, I pray you'd speak to hearts tonight. Speak to that couple, Lord, that maybe is uh, struggling. Speak to that couple, Lord, where there's animosity and tension, Lord, and may you deal with them tonight. May they do business with you tonight. Lord, may they go home, Lord, with a clear mind and a clean heart. Lord, may you help your people tonight. We'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You need to come? Why don't you come? Why don't they say Jesus, keep me near the cross. Listen, don't be embarrassed tonight. The devil has tried it on all of us. The devil has sought us out to try to wreck us and ruin us. We've all been there. And I wouldn't let my pride keep me in a pew. I'd come to business with God. Because what you think of me means a whole lot less than me keeping my home together, my, my church together, and my relationship with God.
say, what Christian song is that? That's called Foggy Mountain Breakdown. Right <laughs> Let's all stand. We'll be dismissed with a word of prayer. Good to see y'all tonight. Glad if you're visiting us. Thank you for coming. Please come back and see us. We're glad you came to be with us tonight. We're going to bow our heads go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Deuce said, if you wouldn't mind, would you please dismiss us, sir? Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for being with us tonight, Lord. Thank you for a good day in church, Father. We just pray, Lord, that you just watch over us all as we uh, go our separate ways, Father. Uh, bring the church back together next week, Father. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.